Wow, that's a lovely big round of applause. Well, it's really, really nice to be here with you today. So we're here at Whitmore Park School in Coventry, and we've got about 600 children here. So I just want to say hello to you all. And, oh, hello. And very excitingly, we've got lots of children, not just around the country, but around the world, tuning in as well. So I just want to say a few hellos to them first. So here's some of them. We've got Bangor Academy. We've got Grangefield Primary School in Gloucestershire. We've got Woodbridge Primary School in Suffolk. And very excitingly, we've got the International School of Cape Town in South Africa tuning in today. So I wonder if we could shout a big hello to everyone tuning in. So you can shout hello after three. One, two, three. <laughs> hello, everyone. So I should probably introduce myself. So I'm Alex T. Smith. So I'm an author and an illustrator, and I'm here with you for about 45 minutes today. So we're going to try and squeeze an awful lot into that time. So this is my plan for the day. So what we're going to do is I'm going to first tell you a little bit about what I, uh, how I became an author and an illustrator. And I'm going to show you some pictures up there. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it's like to be an author and an illustrator, because it is quite an unusual job. Um, then I'm going to, uh, I might draw some pictures for you. Then I thought I would read to you from my newest book. So many of you will know that I write a series of books about a small, plump dog called Claude. Uh, if you don't know about Claude, don't worry, because you will, you'll know all about him by the end of the um, session. So I'm going to read a little bit to you from the newest Claude book, which is called Claude Going for Gold. And then I'm going to be teaching you how to draw Claude. So we'll do that nice and quickly, but I'll give you some secret illustrator's tips as well to make your pictures look really good. Um, and then we'll move on to some questions, both from in this hall and from the live, live stream audience. Uh, and then I might tell you some secrets as well. Um, so that's my plan. Does that sound all right, everyone? Yeah. OK, brilliant. OK, let's get started then. So like I said, I'm Alex. And that's Claude, and we'll find out a bit more about him in a minute. So um, let's get going on to the next slide. Uh, it's not working. So I have been an author and an illustrator for about 10 years now. And up here are some of the books that I've worked on. So because I'm an author and an illustrator, I do both jobs quite a lot of the time. So I write the books, so I write the words, and that's what an author does, and I draw the pictures. So here are some of the ones I've worked on over the past uh, 10 years. So I've written uh, nine Claude books, uh, 11 picture books. I've worked on other people's stories, so I've illustrated other people's stories or created the characters for other people's stories, and they've gone and written them, and then I've drawn the pictures. Uh, I've also done lots and lots of front covers for books, some of which you might know, and I've even had the very exciting opportunity to illustrate some of my favorite stories. So down here, we've got the 101 Dalmatians, which I illustrated last year, which I absolutely love. So that's one of my favorite stories. So I have been able to do lots and lots of things. But of course, I, didn't, I wasn't born as an author and an illustrator. I started out a little bit like you, so... Um, on to the next slide, we've got, uh, that's me. And that photograph was taken last week. Um, no, it wasn't really. That's a little bit of a time ago. So there, I'm about two, or maybe 18 months, two years old. And can you see, I'm already covered in paint, and I'm already drawing and painting pictures. And that's because from the minute that I could hold a pencil or a paintbrush in my hands or a crayon, I drew all the time. Um, and in fact, my first ever memory of anything that I can remember is of being about that age there, sitting on that chair with my mum and dad, and I, had, I can remember the piece of paper in front of me, and I had a pen in my hand, and I drew a picture, and that's my first memory. So I thought maybe I would show you what my first picture was. So I was two, and I think you'll be really impressed. So this is what I drew. So I drew a big circle. And then I drew the, some sticks coming out of it like that. Do you think that's brilliant? It's not very good, is it? But I was only two. And shall I tell you what that is? That's my teddy bear. So um, my first memory is drawing a teddy bear. Now, although it doesn't look like a teddy bear, I can remember saying to my mum and dad that this is a teddy bear. And I remember drawing its big round tummy and its legs sticking out, its arms and legs. And then I got a little bit bigger and I just kept drawing. So this is a picture that I drew when I was four. 
So this is when I started school. And when I started school, the film The Little Mermaid by Disney had just come out in the cinemas, and everybody loved it. It was really, really, really popular. So I drew this picture for a friend of mine who really loved it, but I actually was so pleased with this picture, I kept it. And I actually have that at home in my studio. So that's when I was four. Now, the other thing that I did, um, if we go to the next slide, is that I had, um, I always had a sketchbook with me all the time, even as a child. So when I was little, my mum and dad maybe kept it in their bags or in their pockets. Um, but I just drew all the time. So if I was waiting at the dentist to go and see the dentist, or I was in the car or in a traffic jam, I used to draw. So this is from my sketchbook from when I was five. So I used to draw things that were in my imagination, so animals and wizards and witches and all things like that. But I used to copy things from books as well. So this is a picture that I drew of a field mouse in its nest. And I can actually remember doing that as well, drawing it in front of the fire. And also, when I didn't know what else to draw, I just looked around me and I spotted things that I could draw there. So this pencil, and those scissors and that ruler were just on my desk so I drew those as well so I was always always drawing and I loved stories now I was very very lucky if we go on to the next picture um, to have a very special granddad so this is me as when I'm a little bit older I'm the little boy not the older man just so you know so that older man there is my granddad Sid and he had been a writer and he'd been a um, teacher, and he'd been a librarian. And he, but all the time he was doing those, he wrote stories all the time. So he used to write stories, as in books, but he used to write stories to read in magazines, and he used to, read artic he used to write articles. And he used to write a lot for a magazine that's still going today called The Lady. And he used to tell me, and I'm not sure whether it's true or not, that um, The Lady is the Queen's favourite magazine. So he would tell me at about 11 o'clock in the morning, when she was feeling a bit 11 o'clock-ish, she would sit down, put her feet up, take her crown off, put her handbag down, and she would read The Lady magazine, and she would lead, read some of his stories. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but if I could ask you to do me a favour, and that is, if you ever meet the Queen... Could you ask her whether she ever can remember reading my granddad Sid's story? She might remember, but she might not. But if you could do that for me, that would be a really good help. Now, the reason I'm telling you about my granddad Sid is because uh, he was very important into the reason that I became an author. So when I was little, he used to pick me up from nursery. So my nursery used to finish at, at lunchtime, and we used to walk back home together, and we would go to the park, and we'd go for long walks, and we'd go and investigate things. But then when I started school, when I was in reception, my granddad didn't know what to do. Suddenly, he had a whole day on his own with my grandma. And I thought, although I think she might have enjoyed going for a walk, I don't think she would have liked having a go on the swings and the slides. So he was a bit stuck. So we came up with an idea, and that was that I would go to school in the morning, and I would leave my pet dog at home, because I wasn't allowed to take my dog to school, unfortunately. And at about 10 o'clock in the morning, he would come and fetch her and take her just around the corner to his house, and she would play with their dogs all day. And then after school, I would collect my dog from them. So that's what we did. So one morning, when I was in reception, I left my teddy bear on the sofa, went off to school, and when I came back, if we go to the next picture, I found this in my teddy bear's paws, and I've got it here for you. Now, this paper once used to be white, but can you see it's gone very uh, yellow in age because it's very old now. And it had my name on it, so my full name is Alexander. So I found this in my teddy bear's paws and I opened it. And what it was was a story that my granddad had written for me that day about what my toys had been doing whilst I'd been at school. They'd had an adventure. So this is years before the film Toy Story, but it was that sort of idea. So my granddad knew that my toys came to life and he, would, he wrote me a story about what they did that day. So I thought this was really nice. So I wrote a little thank you note back, put it in my teddy bear's paws, went to school the next day. And when I came back that afternoon, I found a different letter with my name on it. So I opened it up again, and it was a different story that my granddad had written for me. So my, my toys had had a completely new adventure that day. Now, he didn't just do that once or twice. He did that every school day for about four or five years. I'd get a different story every day. So I'd come home and find something new on the sofa at home. And I thought that was brilliant. Now, when I got to about the end of year four or year five, and it was about this time of year when it's really hot, um, I came home from school, and I didn't find one story in my teddy bear's paws. If we can just go to the next picture. I found a book in my teddy bear's paws, and this is it. And actually, I don't take this round very, very often anymore, because can you see it's really old, and it's starting to fall apart? 
So I have to look after it because this book is very precious because nobody else in the whole world has this book. But what this book is, is it's a collection of the stories that my granddad had written for me. Um, he, t he decided to pick out 20 of my favorite ones and he'd written them down in his very best handwriting without one spelling mistake in this book. So it was an old diary that he hadn't used years before. Instead of throwing it out, he thought he would recycle it. So he wrote 20 of my favorite stories in it. But the other thing that he did, which I didn't know about, was that he'd been sneaking my toys out of my house, taking them to his house, and he'd been taking photographs of them, so he'd been posing them, so he was creating pictures with them. So he'd illustrated the book, but with photographs. And it was really, when I got this book, when I was in year five or year four, that I thought, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be an author, I want to write stories for children, and I want to put pictures with them. But because I like drawing and painting, maybe I could be an illustrator. So that's what I decided to do. So I grew up, finished going to school, and I trained to be an illustrator. So that's how I became an author and illustrator. And what's really nice is that now um, I can draw pictures of my granddad. So if we go to the next picture, this is a picture that I drew of me when I was a little boy. And that's my granddad there, and we used to read all the time. So I sneak him into as many books of mine as I can. So there might be someone called Sid, there might be someone who looks a bit like him, or there might be someone who just is a little bit like him in their personality. So I try to sneak him in. So you need to look out for him in my books. Um, so again, that's how I became an author and an illustrator. Now, it is quite an unusual job to do. So the grown-ups here, and if you look at, on the live stream, if you look at um, the grown-ups in the room with you, they're probably your teachers or your assistants or people who help you during the day. Now, in the morning, they have to get up and they have to put their special teacher clothes on and they go to school because it'd be a bit weird if they didn't, if they came to school in their pyjamas. And some people, your, your grown-ups at home, might have to wear a special uniform like some of you are today. Um, but when you're an author and illustrator, you don't have to do any of that because quite often... You work from home. So my office, to get to work in the morning, I don't need to get, a car, get in a car. I don't need to catch a bus. I don't need to ride a bike. I just get up in the morning, have a big yawn and a stretch, walk to my bedroom door, and do one big step like that across the landing into my office because I work from home. And that's really good because I don't have to put on special illustrator's clothes. I can just go to work in my pajamas if I want to. I try not to do it all the time, but sometimes I do. And the second thing that's really, really good about being an author and an illustrator is that your pets can come to work with you too. So I've got quite a few pets. Shall I tell you what I've got? Okay, I've got three dogs, four gerbils, and a tortoise. And they all come to work with me every day. The tortoise lives in my studio, actually. So I thought what I might do is I might draw one of my dogs for you. Would you like to do, me to do that? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw one of my dogs, um, but I want you to listen because I'm going to give you clues to see if you can guess what she's called. So you need to really listen carefully. Now, if you have an idea, just pop your hands up, but keep listening. So keep quiet. So keep listening because your ideas might change when I give you my other clues. So this is my uh, littlest dog. And actually, um, telling you that she's little is very important because she's really really tiny. Would you like to know how small she is? Okay, so if you make a fist with your hand like that and you look at it, that's about how big her head is. And if you ping up your little finger and your index finger like this and wiggle them about, that's about how big her ears are. And her paws, if she was here today and there was a big muddy puddle or a big, uh, I'd spilt some paint and she walked through it, her little footprints that would lead out of the room are only about the same size as the tip of your thumb. So she's really small. In fact, she can pretty much sit on the palm of my hand there. She can sit her bottom on there. So she's really tiny. So shall I draw her for you? Yeah. Okay, let's have a go now. So she's got, what I'll do is I'll draw it and then I'll turn it round. So she's got a little head like that. And she's got big eyes like this. And she's very pretty, so we'll give her some nice eyelashes. And she's got big ears. Now, the type of dog that she is is called a chihuahua. And what they like to do is um, they like to, even on a really hot day like this, 
they like to snuggle underneath blankets. So she might be upstairs fast asleep under a blanket, but she needs those big wiggly ears to listen because if I go downstairs and get a drink from the kitchen, I might just open the biscuit tin and a biscuit might just fall out and she might have to come and rescue it from the, from the floor with her teeth and gobble it up. So that's why she needs big, big uh, ears. So she's got little eyebrows. She's got a little pink nose, a little smiley face and a little nose like that. Now for the next bit, I want you to use your imagination because I'm going to draw her wearing a little collar. Now she does often have a collar and in fact, I've just bought her a new one but unfortunately, she can't wear it all the time because one of my other dogs is a puppy and puppies like to nibble things all the time. And my puppy likes to nibble other dogs' collars the best. So what she does is she chases this little dog around and then sits chewing on the collar until it falls off. And, it's, and, it's, and she's gobbled it all up. So we're going to imagine that she's got a collar because your second clue... So your first clue is that she's named after something you might like to eat as a treat... So you need to think about that. And your second clue is that she's named, her name begins with the letter C. So that's your second clue. So again, if you've got an idea, pop your hands up, but keep those ears turned on and listening because your idea might change. So she's got tiny little paws like this. Okay. She's got a tiny little tummy and tiny little feet like that. She's got a little back and a tiny bottom and a little tail there. Now, for this next bit, I just need you to quickly close your eyes and use your imagination because when you open them, you need to imagine that the picture that I've drawn is all brown. So she's almost all brown. So if you open your eyes, use your imagination. So she's nearly all brown. She's got some splodges of other colours on her, but she's nearly all brown. And that is your final clue. So let's go over those clues again. She's named after something you might like to eat as a treat. Her name begins with a capital C. And she's nearly all brown. Let's go here. What do you think in your nice big voice? What do you think her name might be? Chocolate. chocolate. That's a really good guess because her name means chocolate. But we'll give one more guess and see. It's a shorter word for chocolate. What do you think it might be? Yeah. Cocoa. Yes, well done. But... Because my name is Alex T. Smith, I thought she needed a bit of a bigger name. She's a tiny dog, but she needs a big name. So her name is actually Coco P. Smith. And I wonder if you can guess what the P stands for. If you were very lucky, you might have had it for breakfast because it goes with the word Coco, and it might be something you ate for breakfast. What do you think it is? Shout it out. Pops, yes. So she's Coco Pop Smith. Now, when I got her, she actually had a different name. Her name was Truffles. And I thought, I can't stand in the middle of a park shouting, come on, Truffles, go to the toilet, Truffles. What? I, I, so I thought I'd give her a much more sensible name. So do you think Coco Pop's more sensible? Yeah. yeah, I do too. A lot of people in the park don't think so, but I think it's more sensible. So if we can just go back to the pictures. So um, that's what is really good about being an author and an illustrator is that you get to work from home. Not all the time. I sometimes come out and, and speak to children like this. And I get to create stories and draw pictures all the time. And my dogs get to come with me. So a few years ago, I was surrounded by my dogs. And I thought, I think I might write a story about a dog. So I've actually written quite a few of them now. And my little dog that I write stories about is Claude. So I thought I might read it out to you now, a little bit of the, the newest story. So as you know, this summer, we've got the Olympics. We've got lots of sports things going on. We've got the football on at the moment. And then we've got the Olympics later on. So in this story, Claude gets involved with some sport. Now, the two things you need to know about Claude before we start is that he's often wearing a beret. That's like a little flat hat that he wears. He's not in that picture, but uh, he usually is. And this beret is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside because it looks like an ordinary hat, but he seems to manage to squeeze an awful lot of stuff into this hat. Sometimes he brings his trampoline out of there. Sometimes he's got an entire tea set, so a kettle, a teapot, uh, cups and saucers. He's sometimes got tennis rackets in there, all sorts of things, dressing up costumes. So that's the first thing you need to know. And the second thing you need to know, it's really important, is about Claude's best friend. So your best friend might be in the room that you're in at, at school, 
Your best friend might be here. Your best friend might be someone from home. It might be a grown-up. It might be a granddad or a grandma. It might even be a cat or a dog or another animal. But Claude's best friend is a sock called Sir Bobbly Sock. And you're going to find all about him in a minute. So let's get started on this story. Um, so first page, Claude is a dog. I'll go over here. Claude is a small dog. Claude is a small, plump dog who wears a lovely red jumper and a very fetching beret. That's his hat on top of his head. He lives at 112 Waggy Avenue with Mr. and Mrs. Shiny Shoes and his best friend, Sir Bobbly Sock. So there's Mr. and Mrs. Shiny Shoes. Uh, we never see what they look like. We only ever see them from the neck down, but they look like they're going off to do some tennis today. So next page. This is Sir Bobbly Sock. And there he is. He is a sock, and he's quite bobbly. Every day after Mr. and Mrs. Shiny Shoes have cried, Toodle Pip Claude, and left for work, Claude and Sir Bobbly Sock go on an adventure. Where will they go today? Let's see. It was a Tuesday, and for once, Sir Bobbly Sock couldn't wait to leave the house. Claude, you see, had woken up with ants in his pants. Not real ones, of course. That had been yesterday's excitement. He simply couldn't sit still. And I bet some of you, at some times, you get a bit wiggly and you can't sit still and everything's moving and you need to run around and have a good time. That's how Claude feels today. He ate his breakfast with his bottom waggling about. He brushed his teeth, hopping on one leg, and he's squeezing the toothpaste all out as he does it. And putting his beret on took approximately 45 minutes because he had to pretend that it was first a pancake and then a flying saucer whizzing through space, a flying saucer that managed to knock over two packets of cereal and an entire jug of milk. Eventually, however, the two chums made it out of the front door. Claude took a big sniff. Can you all take a big sniff for me? Today smelt of adventure, he said in his outdoor voice because he was outdoors. Now, I bet some of you have outdoor voices usually, and some of your grown-ups either at home or at school have to say, remember to use your nice, quiet, indoor voice. I bet that's the case. Well, that's what, that's what Claude's like. He loves shouting. So he says, let's go and find something exciting to do. Sir Bobbly Sock was more interested in finding a frothy coffee and somewhere to park himself for a quiet moment, but he nodded his head in agreement, and the two friends bustled along Waggy Avenue. Claude looked everywhere for an adventure. Mr. Lovelybuns was installing a lovely big cream horn in his front window, so he owns a cafe, so he's putting that big cake there. But that didn't get Claude's eyebrows waggling this morning. He was, his tummy was still full from breakfast. Belinda Hint of a Tint, who's the hairdresser, had an appointment book full of curly perms to be done today, but that didn't get Claude's bottom wiggling. Besides, Claude had helped her last week and Sir Bobbly Sock was still recovering. And at Miss Mellon's fruit and veg shop, there was usually a funny-shaped cucumber or some plums that needed juggling. But today, there was nothing, just this banana skin. Claude wandered back outside feeling deflated like a weak old balloon. Can you do a big sigh for me? Oh, there isn't an adventure to be found anywhere he said to Sir Bobbly Sock. And then he immediately tripped over his shoelaces and shot like a cannonball down the street. Uh-oh. Sir Bobbly Sock had ever such a job to keep up with him. It wasn't easy to clatter downhill and almost impossible whilst trying to balance a large frothy coffee in one hand and a handful of Garibaldi biscuits in the other. Eventually, Claude came to a stop by walloping into a marching band who were right at that moment um pa -pa around the corner with quite a crowd behind them. Crash, bang, twang, jangle. Look at the mess Claude's made. When Claude managed to sit up, his head was spinning. Everyone was looking at him, so Claude looked back at them. What a strange group they were. In amongst the band and the crowd of spectators waving flags were a lot of very healthy-looking people. They appeared to be wearing just their vests and some very snazzy, stretchy knickers. Sir Bobbly Sock whipped on his specs to get a better look, and there's Sir Bobbly Sock 
with his, uh, with his glasses on. Now, who do you think these people might be? What do you think their job might be? Let's see. What do you think? They do sports. Do you think they might be athletes or sports people? I think you might be right. So should we see if we can guess what they do? So what do we think this lady here does on the far side? She's got a ball tucked under her arm. What do you think? Basketball. Good, good guess. The man next to her in his swimming costume? Swimming. swimming. What about this man in the middle with his big muscles? Swimming. Wrestling. Or he might lift really heavy weights, maybe. And what do you think this lady's doing here? She's got shorts on and she's got her sweatbands on, like she's going to go for a running. And what do you think this man at the end with his helmet? Cycling, yes. Although someone said maybe he's, doing his ro he's going roller skating, but maybe he's doing both. Maybe he's on his roller skates on his bike, maybe. A bit dangerous, but we never know. Claude was, was about to ask what was going on when a terribly hearty woman in a leotard bounded over. And there she is. Goodness, she cried, I've never seen anyone move so fast. Claude smoothed down his ears. My name is Ivana Hurlitfar, she said. And she went on to explain exactly what on earth was going on. Today was the day of the stonking big sports day, where teams of people from all over the place were getting together to go have a go at lots of sports. There would be medals for the winners and a gigantic trophy too. Ivana wafted her hand in the direction of two chaps holding the most enormous glitzy gold cup you have ever seen, as well as a collection of little gold discs on snazzy red ribbons. Ooh, went the crowd. Can you all do that for me? Can you all go, ooh? Claude had never seen anything so sparkly, and Sir Bobbly Sock was already thinking about how lovely those medals would look around his neck especially if he wore them at the captain's table on a cruise or at a summer garden party. Can I join in, please, said Claude. This sounded like just the sort of adventure he'd been looking for. Ivana looked Claude up and down. Do you have any sports clothes? Any snazzy knickers? Well, Claude had lots of things in his beret, but he didn't think he had any snazzy sports knickers, so he shook his head sadly. Never mind, I'm sure we can find you some, said Ivana encouragingly, lunging in her own, so she's doing a great big lunge there in her leotard. Well, that sealed it. You're on the team, cried Ivana, and this must be your coach. She pointed at Sir Bobbly Sock, who was still gazing at all the snazzy sports knickers and leotards around him. Claude didn't like to say it was actually his best friend, Sir Bobbly Sock, so he just nodded his head, and the crowd shouted, Hurrah! Can you all shout hurrah for me? <laughs> hurrah! Before they knew what was happening, Claude and Sir Bobbly Sock were up on Ivana's shoulders and everyone cheered and umpapared their way to the stonking big sports day stadium. It was only Sir Bobbly Sock who noticed two people who weren't cheering. Hmm. They were standing in the shadows, flipping coins and chewing on toothpicks. Maybe they were on a different team, he thought. As the enormous gold cup and the medals marched past, they looked at each other and chuckled to themselves in a very naughty fashion. Sir Bobbly Sock thought that they too were imagining how nice that trophy would look on their knick-knack shelf at home. But do you think that's what they're really thinking? I think they might have a cunning trick up their sleeve, don't you? What do you think they might want to do? What do you think? Go on here, what do you think? They might be robbers. I think you might be right. And I think they might be thinking about stealing that gold cup. But that's all of the book I'm going to read to you. So to find out whether they do steal the trophy and whether Claude can save the day, you're going to have to finish the story by reading the book, I'm afraid. Because I think about now, it's about time for us to do a bit of um, uh, learning to be illustrated. So I'm going to teach everybody how to draw Claude. So... For the people in their classrooms, if you've got a piece of paper handy and a pencil, you need to grab that now. The uh, children here are going to listen and they're going to test their teachers when they get back to their schools. Let's get going. So, to draw Claude, we start by drawing a hill that's fallen over onto its bottom like this. Like that. Then we draw his nose there, which is just a big circle. And because we want it to look really shiny, this is a good illustrator's tip. We want it to, uh, to look like it's glistening, like it's 
it's shiny. We're going to draw a little circle on it, and then we're going to colour in all the big circle, but leave the inside of that little circle white. So if you want to look, something to look shiny, leave a little bit of it white. Then we're going to do uh, three little whiskers like this. One, two, three. And it helps if you count them out when you do it. Then we're going to draw his ear. Now his ear is just a great big raindrop like this. Down like that. Now I bet lots of you have been told by your grown-ups at school and at home, don't scribble. Well, that is sort of a good thing for them to say because scribbling can be a bit messy and is nice to colour in. Um, carefully. But I think scribbling can sometimes be really useful. And it's something I call special illustrator scribbling. And that's what I'm doing here. So we want Claude's ear to look really hairy because he is a dog. So instead of colouring it in neatly, I'm just very carefully doing some special illustrator scribbling. I'm not going outside of the lines and I'm not going completely bonkers. But I'm just carefully scribbling it in like that. And that makes something look really hairy. So later in the year, if you want to draw a picture of Father Christmas with his big hairy beard, that's the way to colour it in, in a scribbly fashion. So we're going to draw his collar. His collar hasn't been eaten by my puppy yet. We're going to decorate it with some spots. And we're going to do a big circle there for his name tag. We're going to join that together with his little stick there. So we're going to draw his shoulders, little lines. And um, now this next bit isn't really very hard. It's just a bit tricky because we have to leave a gap either side. So we leave a gap and we go down and across and almost all the way up. Do you see? We've left a gap, gap either side. Now we're going to draw Claude's arm on this side behind his back. So we're not going to worry about pointy elbows. We're just going to draw a nice curved shape like this. Like a big capital C and another little one in the middle like that. Now, what I need you to do for the next bit, because we're going to stop being an illustrator for the moment, we're going to be wizards. So if you could just quickly close your eyes and imagine that you're a wizard. Open your eyes again, because I'm going to magically turn this dog, just briefly, into a teapot, like that. Because that's how you draw his other arm. So we're going to go back to being an illustrator now. So we're going to draw his hands. Now, when I was training to be an illustrator... Um, at university, the first thing we had to do was fill a great big sketchbook book up just with pictures of hands. Because if you look at my hands here, can you see all these bits that wiggle? It makes them really, really hard to draw. So I've come up with a really good way of drawing hands. So the first thing you need to do is not worry about it. And just think I'm drawing a little hook like Captain Hook would have there. So can you see that? Now to draw his fingers, you need to think of a restaurant that none of you have probably heard of. Um, it's just a little restaurant called McDonald's. Anybody heard of that? Well, that's super because we always know when there's a McDonald's coming up, don't we, if we're in the car, because we see that great big letter M like that. And we're going to use that letter M to draw Claude's finger. So we're going to do one letter M there. And we have to imagine how great it would be next to that McDonald's if there was another McDonald's there. So we're going to do two together. And we join that together there. Then we're going to draw his tummy and his bottom. And we're going to do his legs. And his legs are just the number 11. So there's one number 11. And there's another one. We join that up in the middle. And then his shoes are just little squashed shapes like that, like little thick black lines. And we really need to make sure that his shoelaces are done up because otherwise he'll crash into a band like in that story. So we're just going to draw some little love hearts there. So that's a good tip to draw um, bows. Now from his feet, we're going to go all the way up to his head and we're going to draw his hat. Now his hat, his beret, just needs to look like a big floppy sausage on top of his head like that. And because we don't want that floppy sausage to fly away in the wind, we're going to hold it in place with a little cocktail stick there. So there's a little stick. Now we're going to draw his eyes. So the first thing we're going to do is two big empty circles like this. Now, I'm going to give you a really good tip, because if we were to draw his pupils, the little black dots, in the, right in the middle of those circles, he'd look like he was staring at us, like a zombie. And we don't want him to look like that. We want him to look nice and friendly. So this is my special illustrator's tip to make your pictures look friendly. So in this circle here, the one nearest to his ear, you are going to draw a little black circle right in the middle. But in this one next door, we're going to draw it here. And then, so you see it's slightly over to one side. Then we're going to draw a big smile up there. Uh-oh, oh, we've forgotten because we've not left enough room for his eyebrows. But because we're illustrators, it doesn't matter if things don't look realistically realistic. So we're going to draw them up there. He's so surprised they've jumped off the top of his head. 
And then we just need to do one last thing, which is his tail. Now, I guarantee, if you don't remember anything else I've said today, you'll remember this. And that's how to draw his tail. It's got to look like he's got a banana, or half a banana, stuck to his bum. So we're going to do that. We'll colour that bit up there. Now, the last thing we need to do is we need to do uh, some more special illustrator scribbling under his feet like that. For, it's for a shadow, and then I'm going to sign my picture because all our artists sign their work afterwards so everybody know that they, they were the ones that created that masterpiece. So there we go. So I hope you've managed to catch up with that uh, in your classrooms uh, on the live stream. And here, I hope you remember that all of those things and you can test your grown-ups at school to see if they can remember how to draw Claude. So... Now that we've done that, I think it's about time we did some questions. So we've got some questions from in the hall. We're going to try and whiz through these. And we've got some coming in from uh, other schools as well. So our first question, I think, is coming from Lexi from Whitmore Park School. So where are you, Lexi? Stand up. There we go. So what's your question? You just need to stand there. How do you feel when you're writing your books? Ooh, that's a very good question. I usually feel very excited but also a bit panicky because I see all the ideas in my head and I've got to get them down on paper really, really quickly. So it's a bit like, it's a bit like waiting for my birthday. I just want to, get it all, I want to get it all finished and I want it to be a book already. So I get really excited, but also I'm always a bit nervous to see whether people will like it as well. So that's a really good question. So our next question is coming from Courtney from Whitmore Park. Courtney Blackbird, which is a really nice name. So what's your question, Courtney? What makes to be a good author? Oh, I think, what, to make, what makes you a good author? I think reading, reading, reading. That's really the, the answer there. And practicing writing stories all the time. Because I think your brain uh, almost eats books. So, so if you want to be really healthy, you feed your body with really good food, don't you, to make yourself really healthy. So if you want to be a writer, you need to feed your brain. And the best way to do that is to, is to read stories. So that's, that's what you, you need to do if you want to be an author, I think. So thank you very much. So we've got one more from uh, Whitmore Park. We've got Charlie next. Where's Charlie? There we go. What's your question, Charlie? What do you come up with the cool book titles? What, how, what book are you going to... What's, what's, what's your question, sorry? How do you come up with the cool book titles? How do I come up with the cool book titles? Well, I'm really glad that you think they're cool. Actually, it's not just me that comes up with them. So I work with lots of people at my publishers, the people who make the books... And we work on the title together because we need to make sure you know what's going to happen in the book, but there's still lots of surprises as well. So that's what we do. So we've got a question from, we've got a sacred heart in the room, but actually there's another sacred heart listening in. And we've got a question here from Ben Guntrip. And he says, will Claude ever go to space? Well, lots and lots of children ask me that. And I'm afraid the only answer I can say is watch this space because there might be a Claude space-themed book coming in the future, but I can't tell you any more about that. So we've got another question from in here, um, which is from Dara, Dara at uh, St. Augustine's. Where are you, uh, Dara? How many hours does it take you to write a Claude book? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Well, lots and lots, actually, but I think a lot of that time is spent me thinking and looking out the window, um, because I think about the story for a long time, and then often little bits of it will come to me, so I write them down on my phone uh, and then email them to myself. And then when I've got enough, I start putting it together like a jigsaw on my computer in my studio. So it takes a long time, but I can usually make a whole Claude book with the pictures as well in about four months. So it takes about four months to do a Claude book. So we've got a question from Sammy from Hodge Hill School here in the room. What's your question? Where do you get your ideas for your book? for your stories and illustrations? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, I have to say, I'm thinking of ideas all the time. And what's really nice about being an author and an illustrator is coming to visit schools like this and going to talk to children. I get lots of ideas uh, from, from you all, so my brain is whirring all the time, so you need to look out for my books in the future because someone who maybe has your shoes or has your name or something like that might pop in one of my stories. So I'm just always collecting stories, but usually I get good ideas from from uh, talking to people like children in schools. Okay, so we've got um, a question from the Sacred Heart School that's here. So we've got Harry with a question. Where's Harry? Just wait for that microphone. There you go. What's your question, Harry? What was your 
childhood favourite story and why? Oh, my favourite childhood story was The Tiger Who Came to Tea. Because I love that story, but some of you might know it because it's about a tiger that turns up and eats everything in the house. But my favourite bit in it is the fact that once the tiger has eaten everything, the little girl has to go out with her mum and dad to a cafe and have sausage bean and beans and chips uh, in a cafe at night time. But the most exciting thing for me when I was little is that she did it all in her pyjamas. And actually, even as a grown-up, I'm still waiting for someone to take me out to dinner for sausage beans and chips in my pyjamas. So that's why I like that story. It's a very good question, Harry. So we've got another question from... Um, We've got Oliver from Broadmeadow Primary School, who isn't here, he's on the live stream, and he says, how do you come up with the funny names in your books? Well, I don't really know. I just think about the type of character they are. So like Mr. Lovely Buns, he works in the bakery, so he probably makes really nice lovely buns to eat. So that's where I got the name from, so I'm always listening out for good words. So um, we've got time for maybe one more question. And that question comes from, let me see if I've got it. Uh, it was from, I can't find it now. Um, oh, yes, here we go. It's from Marcus at Aldermore Farm Primary School. Where's your question? Uh, what is your favorite Claude book that you have written and why? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm actually, I'm glad that you asked that because I can finish off today by answering that question and telling you some secrets as well. So, I think most authors would say that their favourite book is the one that they've either just finished or the one that they're working on at the moment. So, I've just finished, if we can go to uh, this picture here. No, back, back one. Um, Claude's first picture book, which is called Claude All at Sea. It's my new Claude picture book, so I'm really excited about that. Claude manages to flood his bathroom and sail out to sea in his bathtub, and he gets gobbled up by a sea monster called Nigel, and he has to think, how can I escape from Nigel's tummy. But I'm also really excited because I've just finished another Claude book, which is coming out after the summer holidays in October. And I'm really excited about this one. It's called Santa Claude. And there's a front cover for you there. And Santa Claude, in that Claude accidentally kidnaps Father Christmas, which is bad enough, but he happens to do it on Christmas Eve. So whilst Father Christmas is handcuffed to an armchair at Claude's house, Claude and Sir Bobbly Sock have to deliver all of the presents. Let's see if he can manage to do that. So they're my two favorite ones at the moment, but I do love them all. Now, just before we finish, I've got something very exciting to tell you. It's a little bit of a secret, but I can tell you now, is that from not this autumn, but next autumn, so a whole year away, you'll not only be able to read Claude as a book, you'll be able to watch him on television. Because if we go to the next picture, Claude is going to be uh, made into a TV show, and it's going to be shown on Disney Junior to begin with. And uh, we're working really hard on the program at the moment, so I'm writing some of the stories as well. And uh, we cannot wait for you to see that. So you need to look out for all those extra books that are coming out, and for Claude on TV. So I think that's probably about uh, uh, all the time I've got with you, with you today. So I just want to say a great big thank you to everyone here for coming to listen to me and everyone on the live stream as well. So everyone tuning in, um, I hope you've enjoyed that and I've heard you, I hope you've learned some uh, good tips to be an illustrator and some good tips maybe to be an author. So I think we'll just finish off by everyone giving themselves a big round of applause because you've done really well. And we'll just say goodbye to everyone tuning in. So can everyone say bye? Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>